friends, I want to welcome you back to Transform by His Presence, a weekly online study of God's Word as we go through the book of Joshua during this coronavirus pandemic. We are referring to it as Transform by His Presence because we know that that's exactly what God does when we meet Him on the pages of Scripture. So you know the drill, but uh, I'll remind you once again, the things that you're going to need for our time together is a Bible. I'll be reading from the New International Version or the NIV. You're going to need a notepad and some sort of writing utensil. And I want to remind you that you can pause the video right here and go to the resource section, which is just below the video, and print out the worksheet. You don't need the worksheet, but it will certainly make our time together and your note taking much easier. So let's go ahead and get started. But before we do, let's open with a word of prayer. Pray with me, if you will. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is timeless and that it is able to transform the hearts and lives of those who sit under it. I pray, Lord, that you will come and meet with me on the pages of scripture. Give me ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to respond to you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. So last week, when we left off in Joshua chapter 1, Joshua was telling the Israelites to prepare themselves, to get ready to enter into the promised land in three days' time. They're currently camped on the eastern side of the Jordan River, and to the west is lies the promised land, which lies between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. They've been here before under the leadership of Moses. They've been here, they've been able to see into the promised land, and yet they have been unable to enter it. In fact, for the past 40 years, they've wandered around in the wilderness, seeking a place for them to live because of their unfaithfulness, because of their lack of trust in God, because of their rebelliousness, God has not allowed them to enter the promised land. But today is a new day. They're not their parents or their grandparents. This is a new generation that has come up under the leadership of Joshua, and they have an opportunity to move forward in faith and to experience the blessings of God they can see the promised land from a distance. The question for them is, will they be able to move forward in faith? For the Israelites, the promised land, it's a physical piece of land. It's an inheritance that has been promised to them by God himself way back in Genesis 15. It's often described as a land flowing with milk and honey a place of blessing and provision. But beyond that, it's also a place in which they would be able to call home because for centuries they have been almost like nomads, a place of no home. They've had to, to journey from one place to another. And for 400 of those years, they have been enslaved in Egypt. And although the promise is theirs, this promise of an inheritance, this promise of land, they've yet to take hold of it. As we read about the Israelites and the promised land, we may feel a little bit disconnected and wonder, how, how does this apply to our lives today? What does the promised land have to do with me in today's society? And I want to read to you a really incredible passage of scripture from the New Testament. This is from Galatians 3, verses 7 through 9. It says, Understand then those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. In other words, you see, as children who are believers in Christ, we too are children of promise. We have many promises of God that are given to us in Scripture. You can find whole books on the promises of God. 
But as you read through scripture in, in the Old Testament, but also many in the New Testament, things such as peace, joy, wisdom, guidance, protection, provision, the fact that God will never leave you nor forsake you, that we have a good future, future hope, God will illuminate our path and that we're no longer slaves to fear. We have so many promises of God given to us in scripture, but perhaps like the Israelites, you've come to a place in life where you've perhaps read about the promises of God or you've heard about the promises of God, but you've yet been able to live into them fully. If this is you, I want to encourage you that today is a new day. Today we can choose to step forward in faith and no longer see the promised land from a distance, but instead to experience the promises of God up close and personally. So as we go together in our word today in Joshua chapter 2, part of our goal in this study is that we learn how to study the Word of God for ourselves. And one way that we can do that is that when we read a passage of Scripture, that we ask some of those questions, the, the who, what, where, when, why, and how questions. When we do this, the text, it's no longer one-dimensional. The people and the stories, they begin to take shape in our mind, and, and then we're able to relate to them in our own life. It provides us some of the historical context and really helps to bring the story alive. So we've heard about the promises and we've, with these questions in mind, the who, what, where, when, why, and how, now I want us to go ahead and read Joshua chapter two together. We're gonna read the whole passage in its entirety and then we'll go back and unpack it a bit. So let's go ahead and read Joshua chapter 2. It says, Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea, for when you came up out of Egypt, and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is a God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. She said to them, Go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return, and then go on your way. 
Now the men had said to her, This oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless, when we enter the land, you have tied the scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother and brothers and all your family into your house, if any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on your head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. When they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river, and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, The Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. So there is so much just in this one chapter alone, more than we have time to cover today. So I want us to focus in on the one person who takes center stage, and that is Rahab. So what do we know about Rahab? What is the who of this passage of scripture? First of all, we know where she lived. We know that she was a resident of Jericho. Now Jericho was an important city located about five miles west of the Jordan River. It was located in a valley and it was the gateway to the Transjordan area or also to Palestine. Her home from the spy's perspective, it was strategically placed. It was within the city walls themselves, providing them as they went out to, to spy out the land, a vantage point to see not only the strengths, but the weaknesses of the city of Jericho. Another thing to note about Rahab was that she was a businesswoman. There's some indication that perhaps she ran a kind of brothel, serving both as not only an innkeeper, but a prostitute as well. And for a woman to be in business in those days, it meant that, that she didn't have a husband because at those times, a husband would have been the one who would have been the provider. And although we know she had family because the spies, they mentioned her father and mother and, and siblings, but there was no one in the, the world that she lived in that was taking care of her. She had to look out for herself. And we know that she was a prostitute, whether by choice or by circumstance, we don't really know. In those days, there were two primary types of prostitutes. There were the shrine prostitutes, and these worked at the pagan temples, such as Baal or Ashtoreth. And then there were just the sort of run-of-the-mill prostitutes, the ones who worked for cash, like that we think of today. And Rahab, she was uh, the second type of prostitute. And she would have been someone that, you know, although this was uh, a trade that was well known within their culture, she would have been someone that others looked down upon in society. And as a side note, something to note about Rahab, something that's not in your scripture, but something that I came across in my reading is that according to rabbinical tradition, Rahab was noted as one of the four most beautiful women in ancient Palestine, in the ancient world, along with Sarah, Abigail, and Esther. I don't know why that's really important, but I, I want us to get a visual of, of who Rahab was because it helps to bring the story alive of, of the type of life that she lived, the things that she had to go through. And when we do that, it really helps us to understand some of what is going on in scripture. And then we are able to apply it to our life. So now we've talked a little bit about the who, the what, and where of Rahab's life. 
But now I want us to focus on the thing that really set her apart and that speaks to the why and how question. And that is her faith. So there are four things that I want us to note about Rahab's faith. The first thing that I want us to note about her faith is that God met Rahab where she was. You see, she didn't grow up in a believing family. She didn't grow up in a believing community. In fact, this was a pagan community in which they worshiped many false gods and idols. For us, although it certainly helps when we grow up in families that teach us about God or in communities in which going to church is commonplace, somewhere that we might actually hear the message of Jesus, all of these things are great things to have. However, it's not necessary in order for us to come to faith. You see, God's heart is for all people. His desire is for all people to come to a saving knowledge of him. But he'll make himself known to us, whether through a person, an event, a circumstance, even a dream or a vision. I even know someone who came to faith through one of the little golden books that you read as a child. She didn't grow up in a believing family. In fact, she said quite the opposite. But when she received a set of golden books as a child, and one of them was about God, she said that when she read it, that, that she had this sense of his presence in her life at that time. And all of this, God leads me to our key point number one, is that God will meet us where we are. It doesn't really matter um, the how he comes into our life but god will make himself known to us when we are open to hear his message the second thing to note about rahab's faith was that she didn't have to have everything all figured out before responding in faith she did know some about the israelites god that he had parted the sea that he had given the land to them as an inheritance but she didn't know all about him. She didn't know his laws. She didn't know his commands. She hadn't studied for herself or even been in a place in which she would have heard the message. But what little she did know about him, she responded in faith. Four times Rahab refers to God as the Lord. The Lord has given you this land. The Lord has dried up the Red Sea. The Lord is in heaven above and on earth below. Swear to me by the Lord. You see, she wasn't able to explain the how and why of the stories. She had heard and she responded with a little bit she did know. And the same can be said for you and me. The reality is that we'll never have it all figured out this side of heaven. As we read in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, it says, Now we see things imperfectly, like, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then, when we go to heaven, we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then, when I am in heaven, I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. You see, sometimes people think they have to have it all figured out before they accept Christ as their Savior. They want to be able to explain the miracles and how they're possible. They want to know the fine print before they step out in faith. But what we see in Rahab is someone who didn't know the whole story. She didn't have all the answers, and yet she responded in faith. And this leads me to our second key point today. We don't have to have it all figured out before responding in faith. The third thing to note about Rahab's faith is that it was not just words for her, but an action. Rahab put her money where her mouth is. She didn't just say she believed. She staked her life on it. She put her faith into action when she hid the spies, lied to the king, and made a deal with the enemy. And because of her faithfulness, 
we're still talking about her thousands of years later. Rahab is commended for putting her faith into action. We read about her three times in the New Testament. We read about her in James 2, verses 25 and 26. It says, in the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did? Not just what she said, but what she did when she gave the spies lodging and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. You see, our faith and our words, our faith and our actions, they need to be working in tandem. Our faith should be followed by actions that reflect what we say we believe, that we're willing to forgive, that we feed the poor, that we look out for the marginalized, and that we love our enemies, and we provide for the widow and the orphan. You know, what we tell our kids and what we show our kids, it's, it's very powerful. They learn a lot more by what we do than what we say. Liz Curtis Higgs write, obviously this wise woman sensed an upheaval, spiritual and otherwise, about the sweep through Jericho. She reasoned things through and made the most important decision of her life to put her faith into action which leads me to our third key point for today. Faith is more than words. Faith is an action. The fourth thing that I want us to note about Rahab's faith is that it was truly a model for all believers. In Hebrews chapter 11, which is in the New Testament, better known as the Hall of Faith, she is listed along with with the heroes of faith, people like Noah and Abraham and Moses, all of which served as models of faith. And Rahab is mentioned in, as one of these models of faith. In the New Testament, she's mentioned three times, as I stated earlier, in James and Hebrews, which we already stated. But the third mention of her in the New Testament and by far the most noteworthy mention in the New Testament is in Matthew 1 5 in which she is listed in the lineage of Jesus. One of only a handful of women mentioned in Christ's lineage she will be forever remembered because of it. From prostitute to honored woman of faith once again, we see that our past does not determine our future, that God, he can make beauty from ashes, and he's able to bring us to a place of honor even when we come from a checkered past, which leads me to our final key point for today. In God's economy, it's not who you are or were that matters, but instead who you are becoming. So for those of you who are new to Bible study, I want to encourage you, hang in there. You're doing great. I promise you that you might not be able to see the growth just like a kid that, that's growing up. You don't see them growing until later on. I've enjoyed our time together, but next week I want us to read chapters 3 and 4. And for those of you who are Bible scholars out there, and you're wanting to ask me, what about the scarlet cord? We'll get to that. Be patient. So here's my challenge this week. Read chapters three and four for, for our time together in our session next week. Ask some of the who, what, where, when, why, and how questions like we discussed earlier that will help really bring the text alive. And finally, find one way in which you can put your faith into action this week. Have a great week. I've enjoyed our time together. See you next time.